Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, hello and I welcome you all uh, to the lecture number 19 of this course titled Psychology of Stress, Health and Wellbeing. So, this is uh, the first lecture of module 7. So, we will we are starting module 7 uh, which is about psychology of happiness and today is the first lecture and overall it is uh, lecture number 19. So, today we will talk about uh, the concept what is the meaning of happiness, what makes us happy uh, from the psychological perspective. So, before we talk about today's lecture, uh, let me briefly give you a recap of the lecture, uh, last lecture that is lecture 18. So, in the last lecture we discussed the concept of resilience and uh, its connection with the uh, concept of well-being. Uh, so, we uh, try to understand and we have discussed that you know the concept of resilience is you know uh, one of the uh, important concept that is very closely connected to the sense of well-being and in fact you know many uh, theorists and researchers consider it as an important component for well-being. So, the idea of resilience is basically our ability to bounce back from the from an adversity or threat or a life crisis. So, it is our ability to bounce back, how quickly we can uh, you know, bounce back from a uh, from an adversity of life or crisis of life and start functioning normally. So, that ability is called a resilience and typically uh, the resilience is discussed in the context of some crisis, threat or adversities of life. So, there has to be some threat, adversity or crisis in life and uh, the next important component is your positive adaptation to those threats and adversities of life. So, uh, many researchers generally you know, consider uh, this uh, resilience as both trait as well as process. So, some consider it as a kind of trait in the context uh, basically means uh, that you know when we say something as trait it is more like your personal quality you know it is kind of characteristics of your personality. Uh, so, many uh, researchers also look, look at resilience from that perspective many researcher looks at it as a process which is which depends on interaction of our internal factors and external factors and many factors kinds of you know bring about your sense of uh, resilience. But generally the idea is sense of resilience can be learned and developed it is not something that we are born with. Then we have discussed the relationship between uh, resilience and well-being uh, mostly the there is not a straightforward relationship in the literature. but most of the research shows that you know uh, increase in the sense of well-being also increases our sense of resilience. Uh, primarily because certain component of well-being such as you know positive emotions, positive relationships, uh, these are key ingredient for enhancing our sense of well-being. Then we have discussed uh, Martin Seligman's uh, model of well-being which is called as PERMA model P E R M A. Uh, which talks about well-being in terms of five component that is positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning in life and achievement or accomplishment. And we have discussed this model in the context of both well-being as well as resilience primarily because uh, the component of PARMA uh, are also very important component for enhancing our uh, sense of uh, resilience. So, we have discussed all this component briefly and we also discussed how can we increase them or build them in within us. So, we have discussed all these things in the last class. So, let us see uh, today's class. So, today we will talk about what is the concept of happiness and what makes us happy uh, you know, from the psychological uh, literature perspective. <clears throat> 
So, the key concept that we will discuss today is uh, what is the meaning of happiness, uh, we will talk about psychology of happiness, then we will discuss uh, one particular researcher's model of happiness which root Winhoven's model, uh, then we will uh, we'll address the question what makes us happy or you know do we really know what makes us happy. In that context we will discuss uh, the concept of effective forecasting and impact bias. So, let us see one by one. So, the concept of happiness is something you know it is an universal goal that we all have. Uh, it is not uh, something that you know only few individual wants happiness and other do not want. So, it is an universal goal in the sense that everybody wants happiness, uh, they are seeking it in different forms. Uh, so, this is something probably you know one of the common thing that unite all of us that we are all seeking happiness in certain ways in some forms the, the way or approach of seeking that may be different. So, in that context one of the uh, you know one uh, French philosopher and mathematician Pascal. Uh, he uh, wrote a very appropriate you know uh, idea about the concept of happiness. He said uh, all men seek happiness, uh, this is without exception. So, there is no exception to it, everybody seeks it. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. So, whatever means they are trying to search it, ultimately they are all trying to get to that the mean uh, whatever happiness they consider. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both attended with, with different views. So, if somebody is going for a war, it is also for seeking happiness and if somebody is avoiding war, that is also for you know seeking happiness. Uh, only you know from the different perspective people are looking at it they will never take the least step, but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. So, even people who commit suicide, probably they think you know doing it will enhance happiness in some way. So, this is an universal goal that everybody is seeking in so many diverse ways to ultimately come to uh, that point called happiness, whatever they consider it. So, happiness is a highly valued in the society also, it is not just an individual level also, people also express this individual wish also uh, in terms of you know collective uh, happiness or enhancing collective happiness. Not only do people aim at happiness in their own life, uh, but also we care for the happiness of other people and the government should aim to increase greater happiness for greater number of citizens. So, this is the ideal philosophy that we all look at that uh, we are not only searching for our own happiness, we are also trying to increase collective happiness in terms of society, in terms of nation. Uh, this is something at least, at least at the philosophical level, this is what we all want for a good society, for a good nation. So, if you uh, see how important this concept is, you know, you just need to look at a, some you know, self-help bookstore or you go to Amazon bookstore, Amazon you know, online uh, bookstore, you will find thousands of books which basically talks about this whole concept of happiness. Uh, so, there will be so many titles associated with happiness, uh, some are you know mostly self help kind of books, some are written by you know uh, professionals and uh, philosophers and psychologists. So, there are so many books you can kind of uh, look at. So, this reflects how people are seeking it and how they think it is so important. So, uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the history of psychology, you know uh, most of its history psychology uh, somewhere we have also mentioned in the past lectures also uh, that psychology was mostly concerned with you know understanding disorders. Uh, such as you know anxiety, depression, neuros neurosis, obsession, etcetera, etcetera. Uh, so, uh, the idea was you know to understand, focus was more on understanding uh, disorders and how to make people come out of their disorders, uh, primarily because that was the need you know there was a uh, lot of psychological disorders were increasing especially after wars and so many you know 
collective uh, uh, social crises and at the individual level also uh, psychiatric disorder has been rising like anything. And uh, so, there was a need to understand psychological disorders and treat people. So, because of that need uh, primarily psychology was focusing on uh, the disorders primarily. Uh, and the goal of practitioners were mainly you know to bring patients from negative ailing state to a normal state of functioning. So, from negative to kind of making them normal. However, uh, in the last few decades with the rise of positive psychology, uh, which is a kind of approach or a branch of psychology, uh, where uh, researchers started giving focus on positive functionings of people, not just you know normal uh, levels of functioning. Uh, where they talked started talking about the concept of happiness, well-being, you know, and the positive state of human mind. So, with those uh, focus or the rise of focus on positive psychology, you know, uh, the concepts such as happiness and well-being uh, started coming into the mainstream of psychology. It was there, but it was uh, never focused, given f enough focus in the past history of psychology. But recently, it is coming up in the forefront, particularly with the rise of uh, positive psychology. Uh, the study of happiness as a concept was primarily you know discussed or you know uh, was part of philosophy or philosophers have been talking about the concept of happiness, the concept of good life, concept of uh, well-being. These are primarily you know where the under the purview of philosophical uh, speculations and discussions. So, philosophers were mostly interested into speculation because philosophers are mostly interested into giving theoretical ideas. Um, armchair speculations. They are not really interested into collecting data and no, analyzing data and those things. So, uh, because it was primarily discussed in the philosophical, you know, uh, in the uh, in the branch of philosophy, uh, it was mostly a speculative kind of uh, literature was available uh, for understanding happiness and well-being. However. Uh, with the rise of positive psychology, once the psychologists started getting interested into these topics, uh, they started measuring this concept also. Because the one of the main difference between the philosophical approach and psychological approach is that you know, psychologists are interested into collecting data and measuring and you know, uh, giving evidence-based kind of uh, theories. So, with with the rise of interest in the concepts such as well-being and happiness in the field of psychology uh, and researcher uh, develop started developing more reliable and valid measures uh, to measure happiness and because of this approach you know uh, in the last few decades you know you know significant evolution of knowledge has happened in this area particularly understanding the concept of happiness and well-being uh, now, it is no longer just speculative, it is more data oriented, if, if you look at you know uh, the literature in psychology. So, uh, what is the meaning of happiness, you know, people uh, define uh, the happiness, you know, in their, everybody may have their own definitions, you know, what is the meaning of happiness. So, we all may subjectively have many views about happiness, you know, uh, so I will give you some examples of some philosophers how they defined it. So, Rousseau defined happiness means a good bank account, a good cook and a good di digestion. So, probably you know in a more humorous way he might have defined it. Uh, he is talking about happiness only in, in terms of you know uh, money and you know, food and health. Another uh, philosopher said happiness is nothing more, th more than health and poor memory. So, this is also another perspective what he said. So, if you have a good health and poor memory means it is the memory that disturbs us so much you know about we remember so many things and which keeps on you know disturbing us. So, if you have a poor memory in that sense he is saying you will be happier. Mark Twain said happiness consists of good friends, good books and sleepy conscience. So, it is because of conscience we feel guilty, shame and so many negative emotions. So, probably a sleepy conscience can make you happy. Aristotle said happiness is the meaning and purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence. So, Aristotle uh, defined it happiness in terms of you know 
meaning and purpose in life. So, if you have very meaningful and purposeful life, uh, then it is a happy life. So, you can see you know there are uh, many definitions, everybody defined happiness in their own ways and uh, it can be defined you know in a diverse ways depending on what do you consider as happiness. So, let us see what how psychology defines happiness. In psychology you know when we talk about any concepts in psychology, uh, we are you know, conceptualizing it in such a way that we can measure it also. So, there is a very concrete indicators are there. In psychology generally we avoid the word happiness uh, because it is it has so many connotations and people have so many ideas as we have seen people define it in so many ways. So, more technically in psychology we use the word subjective well-being which basically means happiness and this uh, subjective well-being is primarily you know defined in terms of uh, two components one is obviously satisfaction with life and second is affect. So, affect basically means emotions you see. So, one is satisfaction with life, how satisfied are you with your life? This is one important component of subjective well-being or happiness and second is your emotional experiences. How do you ex experience life in terms of your emotions, positive emotions and negative emotions. So, more uh, specifically we can uh, say subjective well-being is equal to high positive emotions. So, higher positive emotions you experience more happy happier you are or, or more subjective well being you, you have. So, higher positive emotions lower negative emotions low level of negative emotions plus high life satisfaction. So, this will determine your level of subjective well being. So, if you have more of this more of higher positive more of positive emotions more of life satisfaction and less of negative emotions your level of subjective well-being or happiness will be higher. So, this is uh, how it is conceptualized in psychology. Uh, these are important indicators of subjective well-being or happiness. So, a life satisfaction uh, aspect of uh, happiness uh, is primarily talks about how you assess your life how you evaluate your life uh, in terms of you know of, uh, you know how satisfied are you with your life so uh, your satisfaction with with your life may depend on how you compare your present life with whatever ideal standard you see or project yourself uh, in future so you may uh, you know see uh, in terms of whether you are satisfied or not with your life you will kind of see what is the present condition of my life and you will try to uh, you know compare it with your some projected future standard that you want to achieve. So, if there is a less discrepancy then probably you are more uh, satisfied with your life. Uh, then uh, people uh, also kind of uh, try to uh, you know understand or kind of evaluate life satisfaction based on uh, comparing with other people. So, many times people you know compare themselves with their peer groups and people around them and they kind of derive their sense of satisfaction. So, it depends on uh, many factors how you derive your sense of satisfaction. It may be by comparing yourself with a future standard or it may be comparing yourself with other people. Effect represent emotional side of subjective well being obviously you know the emotional and we all experience you know positive emotions and negative emotions. So, it comprises both positive and negative moods and emotions and uh, are associated with our everyday experiences. So, in the context of understanding uh, happiness and life satisfaction, we look at one particular uh, uh, researcher uh, model of happiness to understand uh, more deeply about the concept of happiness and uh, life satisfaction. So, Ruth Winhoven's model of happiness we will see uh, just to kind of more understand about these aspects of happiness in terms of how it is looked at psychology and some allied disciplines. <coughs> so, Ruth Winhoven is a Dutch sociologist, he is not a psychologist you know per se and he is a sociologist, but he is primarily interested uh, into uh, the scientific uh, study of happiness. 
so he tried to understand happiness uh, from uh, by understanding qualities of life and life satisfaction so he devoted uh, his research by primarily understanding these two concepts one is qualities of life and life satisfaction so these two uh, we'll see what he meant by these two so he uh, kind of tried to conceptualize quality of life using two dimensions one is chances versus outcome in your life so life chances basically means what are the opportunities that you get in your life let's say when you take birth there are certain opportunities in your families you know in terms of whatever things that you get so life provides you certain chances and opportunities what are those life chances you have and outcome specifically means uh, how do you use those chances from potential to actualization so how do you use those opportunities and bring about certain outcomes so there is the means outcomes so one dimension is your life chances and outcomes what are the opportunities that you get in life and what are the outcomes that you bring about by using those opportunities so this is one dimension second dimension is outer and inner qualities of life so there are certain outer qualities in terms of in our environment what are the qualities of life that i get and inner qualities means how do i what is my psychological makeup in terms of how do i deal with you know problems and things how do you look at life what is my out, outlook about my life so this are included in the inner qualities of life so based on these two dimension chances and outcomes versus outer and inner qualities uh, uh root winhoven uh said there could be four qualities of life by you know uh based on these two dimensions interaction of these two dimensions so we can have outer qualities inner qualities and we we can have life chances life results so based on this interaction of this dim two dimensions and there two you know four sub dimensions we can have four qualities of life so uh the first one is livability of environment livability of environment uh, is basically you know uh, based on outer qualities and you know life chances opportunities that life give you whatever opportunities that you find yourself in your life and it is based on outer qualities so in your environment what are the things that you are kind of getting in terms of your life that determines the quality of your life what is the extent to which your you know environment in which you are placed what is the livability of that environment so this is one important quality of life so it may include you know uh, your natural environment nature pollution etc so your environment in which you are placed in uh, in terms of climate in terms of weather in terms of pollution whatever is there so that is uh, uh, that is determined by your outer qualities of life and what life chances life opportunities that give you where you are placed in your life so this component of quality of life livability of your env environment is primarily emphasized by many professional groups particularly you know such as social reformers politicians they all focus on these dimensions of quality of life in terms of improving quality of life livability of your environment improving the livability of your environment in which you are placed in so this is one aspect of quality of life or one quality of life second is uh, based on outer quality we'll see first so outer qualities life chances gives livability of environment outer qualities and life results how do you what is the outcome that you bring about in your outer aspect of your life and that is called as utility of life so this is the second quality of life utility utility of life basically you know talks about how do you use your life in the outer environment in terms of you know higher values and meanings uh you know such as ecological preservation
cultural development. etc so how do you make your life useful in terms of outer environment in terms of higher values and meanings such as you know preserving ecological aspects cultural development of cultural aspects so that is the meaning of utility of life and that th th this is another important aspects of quality of life uh, so many professional uh, groups such as you know uh, pastors moral advisors you know many uh, religious uh, leaders they talk about this aspect of life emphasize this aspect of life in terms of enhancing quality of life use your life in terms of you know social service and those kind of thing now in terms of inner qualities uh, and life chances and life result we can have two more aspects of quality of life so one is called a life ability of the person it is your inner quality based on what how do you uh, find yourself I inside yourself so it basically uh, uh, talks about uh, abilities to cope with you know different problems of life So basically, life ability uh, of the person uh, is is the dimension of quality of life, which talks about ability to cope with the problems and stress and problems of life. Uh, that is your inner abilities to deal with the problems of life. Uh, the uh, many professional groups such as therapists, educators, they give a lot of emphasis on these dimensions of quality of life. You know, uh, to enhancing your inner abilities or life abilities to deal with the problems of your life. And the last one is a satisfaction with life. Uh, this is the dimension which you know, uh, Ruth Winhoven talks about. That this is the dimension that is uh, actually uh, the concept of happiness is connected to this dimension. So life satisfaction is basically you know the results of life in your inner inner aspect of your life. What is the result? So that is how satisfied you are. That is basically uh, talks about you know this is how satisfied are you with your life internally. Uh, this is same as you know same as you know uh, happiness or subjective well-being that we talk about in uh, talk in psychology so how satisfied are you with your life is more important you know uh, in terms of pri primarily uh, you know defining happiness now root winhoven further said this satisfaction with life is uh, not just one thing there may be many dimensions to it also so he said you know uh, similar to four qualities of life there can be four satisfaction with life four dimensions to it so uh, let me just briefly talk about this uh, four dimensions we have already discussed but let's briefly talk about uh, this also so livability of the environment is one quality of life uh, which uh, talks about pollution global warming degradation of nature so how you are placed into your environment so it is it is not happiness per se but it is more like a precondition for happiness so what kind of environment you are placed in will determine your uh, sense of happiness to a large extent life ability of the person uh, which uh, we discussed is denotes inner life chances in terms of your ability to cope with the problems of life how much ability you have uh, in terms of this is your inner ability this quality of life is central to thinking of therapists and educators then utility of life uh, as we have discussed it represents using life for something more than itself so it is more just not about using life just about your own self interest but uh, using your life into something broader which is beyond yourself uh, it is about higher values and meanings such as you know in terms of outer world ecological preservation cultural development whatever you know it could be in the religious context it could be in the social context so moral advisors uh, pastors and these are the people who emphasize these aspects then the last one is satisfaction with life uh, it represents uh, the inner outcome of life in terms of subjective judgment and life commonly referred as uh, subjective well-being or happiness uh, generally no particular professional group directly talks about it you know 
because it is very subjective and uh, individual thing. So, generally uh, we do not find any specific professional groups that talk about, but some therapists and psychotherapists uh, may talk about it indirectly. So, according to Root uh, Winhoven, uh, the life satisfaction is the most appropriate concept to understand happiness as it reflects the degree to which external living condition fits with inner life abilities. So, this life satisfaction is most important in terms of understanding happiness primarily because it reflects the degree who, to which our external condition fit with our inner abilities. So, if you are satisfied with your life that means, there is a fit between your external environment and your inner qualities. Now, uh, as I have said there can be a different as Roots Winhoven said, uh, so life satisfaction is not just one thing, so there can be different dimensions to it also. So, there can be different meanings and aspects to the concept of life satisfaction. Uh, this meanings again can be you know divided based on two dimensions. One is life aspects versus life as a whole. So, your satisfaction may be based on one particular aspect of your life or one domain of your life or is it uh, or, or your life satisfaction is about your whole life. So, as life aspects versus life as a whole. So, your satisfaction can be about a domain or can be about life as a whole. So, this is one aspect. Second aspect is passing satisfaction versus enduring satisfaction. So, what, what, what is your satisfaction kind of in terms of you know uh, temporary or temporal durab durability. So, is it like passing satisfaction or very temporary transient satisfaction or is it enduring satisfaction which endures for a long time. So, based on these two dimensions uh, you know we can have four kinds of life satisfaction. So, one is passing enduring in one, one aspect, one is part of life or life as a whole. So, by interaction of this we can get four life satisfaction. So, one is called as you know the first one is you know when we have a passing satisfaction about part of life, this is called as pleasure. So, pleasure is about you know it is more like you know uh, it could be uh, mostly sensory pleasure. Uh, Let us say having a good food gives you a sensory pleasure. Uh, uh, the pleasure could be intellectual pleasure also uh, such as you know reading a good novel or a good book whatever you like. So, when you read that book you get a lot of intellectual pleasure. So, there can be a sensory pleasure then can be you know intellectual uh, pleasure. intellectual pleasure such as reading a good interesting book, sensory pleasure may include you know having a good food or something that gives you a some sensory stimulation and pleasure. So, the idea is pleasure is very short term it is passing. So, it will be very short term. So, after a brief am amount of time you will no longer experience that. So, it is about parts. So, it is about reading something you know and getting some aspect of your life. It is not about your whole life. So, it is about part of your life and very transitory. Then when we talk about part of life and some enduring satisfaction that is, that is called as part satisfaction, which is basically enduring satisfaction with certain aspect of your life. So, enduring satisfaction with a part of life. For example, you know job satisfaction, you know. So, you may be highly satisfied with your job, but you may not be satisfied with other aspect of your life such as family life. So, this is an example of part satisfaction, satisfaction with certain domains of your life, not every aspect. Then when we look at life as a whole, when it is uh, transitory, this is called as top experience. So, top experience basically you know uh, what Root defined it like you know uh, passing satisfaction with
So, it basically he uh, basically connotes the idea of top satisfaction is that you know certain people such as poets and mystics, uh, sometimes they experience some kind of peak experiences, they, be, they experience some oceanic mystical experiences where you know uh, they do not no longer just their own self egoistic person, you know they experience some broadness in their consciousness, sometimes it is not always, sometimes they experience people who are mystics, who are you know uh, poets, sometimes they get tune into certain you uh, know experiences which can be called as peak experiences. So, those are called top experiences because they do not remain. So, therefore, they are not passing a kind of experience, but they influence your whole life. So, in that sense it is uh, categorized under this term, uh, this category. <coughs> and the last one is life satisfaction which basically he uh, was interested in. So, which is basically enduring satisfaction. So, uh, life satisfaction, he typically defined it as a uh, your hope, satisfaction with the whole life. So, it, it is basically same as the concept of happiness he defined. It. So, uh, these are again you know, kind of briefly disclaim here. Pleasure is about passing satisfaction with the part of life. It can be sensory such as good food or mental such as reading an interesting book. Part satisfaction is uh, it is enduring satisfaction with a part of your life. Uh, it is mostly concerned with the domain of life such as job or work life. One may be satisfied with work life or job, uh, but may not be satisfied with other domains such as family life. Uh, top experience, it is about passing satisfaction about life as a whole. Uh, it may include intense oceanic experiences referred by some poets and mystics. And the last one is life satisfaction, uh, it is enduring satisfaction with your life as a whole which is also called as happiness. So, uh, life satisfaction is most appropriate as a public goal according to Root Winhoven. Uh, uh, enduring satisfaction is clearly more valuable, how because uh, more valuable than passing satisfaction because passing satisfaction are not really reliable. You may be satisfied today and dissatisfied yes you know next day. So, those things may not mean much in terms of policy implications. So, life satisfaction or as a whole more enduring is more relevant for making policy, policies and other thing. So, uh, in psychology you know this is how uh, happiness is conceptualized uh, mostly in terms of life satisfaction as well as your emotional experiences. So, mostly the indicators are this. So, people measure uh, you know researcher measures the emotional experiences of the people. Uh, in terms of their positive emotions, negative emotions and they also measure you know, their satisfaction level with their life. So, that determines the concept of happiness as well as subjective well-being. Now, uh, let us see the next question which is uh, you know, relevant in the context of happiness is uh, do we know what makes us happy? So, do we really know what makes us happy or if I ask this question to people you know or anybody do you know what or what will make you happy in your life? So, just generally we have certain projections in our life about certain things in future if I get that I will be happy. So, some people may say you know it is about relationship if they you know have a good relationship with someone they may be happy. Some people may say if they get certain job they will be happy. Some people may say if they get more money they will be happy. Some people may have losing weight as a target. Some people may be looking better and younger as a target for happiness. Uh, some people may have get you know getting you know uh, babies and kids may be a target for happiness. So, we all have many ideas and many targets that uh, we project in future and if you get them we think that we will be happier. Now, uh, the question is uh, do uh, this is how we kind of if I ask ask people in general. So, they kind of project it like that. However, interestingly in the uh, in the area of psychology you know certain phenomena shows that you know we are not very good at predicting what about the emotional consequences of future events. 
So, in that context there is a two concept that we will discuss one is called as effective forecasting and another is related to that is called impact bias. So, the question is will you become happier if your all wishes come true wishes about future too or can we really predict what will make uh, us happy in future. Uh, effective forecasting is a concept that tries to understand, understand this question or try to address this question. So, effective forecasting includes about basically you know prediction about emotional reactions to future events. So, effective means emotion forecasting means how do you predict the emotional reactions of a future event. So, if some future event happens how do you predict what will be your emotional experience will you be happy will, will you be sad. Uh, so, we we can predict we try to predict a lot of things in terms of emotional consequences in context to certain future events. So, this is called as effective forecasting you know, predicting about the emotional consequences of certain events in future. Now, research in this area shows that you know that people generally mispredict how much pleasure or displeasure a future event will bring generally people mispredict they are not good at predicting the emotional consequences of future events people make lot of misprediction in that context so in that context that is why i ask do we really know what makes us happy we may have certain ideas but are they really do they really bring us bring happiness to us effective forecasting says many times most of the time or you know at least you know uh, regularly people mispredict So, uh, generally people are good at predicting whether future events are likely to be pleasant or unpleasant that sense generally people have you know whether an event will be pleasant or unpleasant you know. So, that generally people can predict, but uh, people are not very good at predicting the intensity and duration of the future emotional consequences. How much how intense our emotional experiences will be you know if if, if certain event happens in future and for how much duration we will experience. So, that prediction uh, generally uh, we are not able to predict very good in a, in, in, in a better way. So, we mispredict generally about the intensity as well as uh, uh, the duration of emotional consequences. So, occasionally uh, people underestimate, but most commonly people overestimate the intensity and duration of intensity and duration of emotional reaction of future events. So, generally for any future events which has some emotional consequence people generally overestimate for both positive event as well as negative events. So, so this is that is why uh, many times it is called as you no know, impact bias is a kind of you know uh, you know kind of emotional durability bias we generally overestimate how much emotion we will experience and for how long. So, that is why it is also called as emotional durability bias. Uh, so, for example, you know many time we might have thought in our childhood that if I get some present or let us say x in my birthday you know this is just and I will be happier and I will I, I will not want anything more. We predicted like that, but once we get it uh, we see you know it is not even closer to you know, ultimate satisfaction many people after some breakup in romantic relationship they think they will never be able to come out of it, uh, but generally people after few days they are able to come out of it. So, when they predict they generally overestimate they think they, uh, they will never be come out of it kind of you know. So, the duration and intensity is they kind of overestimate, but actually when it happens uh, generally uh, the intensity and duration is not that high. So, overestimation that misprediction happens. So, this phenomena is called as impact bias, impact bias. So, impact bias is the error that people make by overestimating the intensity and duration of their emotional reaction to future events. So, particularly in the context of future event whenever we think or predict about their emotional consequences how happy you will be or how sad you will be if x event happens then generally people overestimate. So, this is called as impact bias and uh, this is one of the area under effective forecasting research. Uh, people like Wilson and Gilbert uh, and some of their colleagues have done lot of research in that area. 
and this impact bias uh, research shows that happens for both positive and negative emotions. So, it happens for both cases. If you predict some good event, then uh, your estimation or your prediction about how happy you will be is also overestimated and if something negative that you predict, uh, how sad you will be uh, that is also kind of overestimated. So, for example, we may overestimate how happy or unhappy we would become if we get a desirable or undesirable thing. So, if I get a desirable thing, I overestimate how much happy I will be or how for how long. And if I get something undesirable, uh, we generally overestimate how much sad or sorrow will sorrow ex experience we will get or for how long. So, this is called as impact bias. So, uh, mm, uh, uh, Dune, Wilson and Gilbert, uh, I mean there are many, uh, uh, many uh, evidences uh, were found uh, in the context of impact bias, you know, about future event. Uh, for example, you know, research, research were, were done for college, college football fans, uh, you know, they overestimated the impact of how, of a win of their favorite go group, if they win, how much happy they will be. Uh, research also were done in terms of you know uh, people overestimated the impact of receiving unexpected you know higher low grade on a test. Uh, impact bias was found in varieties of population such as students, even professors, sports fans, people who do dieting, who go for vacation. So, in all these contexts, impact bias was found. Uh, it was also found with various kinds of events such as you know romantic breakups, personal insults, sports victories, electoral defeats. So, research uh, have were done in diverse contexts and uh, the, it was found that people are engaged in impact bias in all these diverse you know, contexts as well as diverse population. So, uh, one uh, for example, simple experiment that was done by you know. Uh, uh, so, this was done by Dune So, for example, I will just give you one a small example. One of the experiment that uh, these people did to see the uh, to investigate uh, this impact bias. So, so they did with uh, a college student uh, who just joined a college or university, you know. Uh, so, when they just joined, uh, they were asked to predict how would they feel if they are assigned, you know, desirable and undesirable dormitories. So, then they, they came, so they generally after once the stu student joins in an institute, uh, they are assigned certain you know hostels and dormitories. Uh, so, they were these new students were asked uh, to predict how they would feel in case they get a very desirable good dormitory and for others uh, if they get very un or undesirable kind of uh, dormitory because when the student join this becomes very important for you know how they you know experience life in the college and other things so the participants predicted uh, you know their overall level of happiness would be after a year so they made prediction after a year what will be their level of happiness if they are randomly assigned to a desirable or undesirable dormitory so they tried uh, they were asked to predict after one year what will be your level of happiness if you were assigned in some cases desirable dormitory and if some other cases if you are assigned a very undesirable kind of dormitory which you do not like and you know, those kind of thing. So, student predicted um, their dormitory assignment and uh, this prediction was measured in terms of how happy they will feel or how sad they will feel after one year and then after actually after one year actually the, it was measured. So, a pre before one year a measurement was done and after one year it was actual level of happiness was measured after the passing of the one year in whatever dormitory a desirable or undesirable dormitory. 
so at the prediction level they found that student predicted that th their dormitory assignment would have a large positive or negative based on negative happy uh, you know, emotional consequence based on desirability or undesirability so if they were asked if it is desirable they predicted their happiness level to mar last larger extent of overestimated uh, and if it is undesirable they underestimated when actually it was measured after one year uh, their happiness level in both categories for desirable and undesirable it was almost same so uh, the graph was like this so this side it was happiness level they measured their whatever projected happiness level in terms of certain score certain scale they have used and for desirable dormitory cat category so this was predicted this was actual level of happiness after one year in case of undesirable this was predicted this was actual so when they predicted if they get undesirable uh, dormitory you know they predicted they will be very you uh, know their level of happiness will be much lower but actually after one year it was almost same as the people who got a uh, desirable dormitory so prediction was always overestimated so in terms of positive emotions they overestimated it in terms of negative emotion overestimated means they kind of said the uh, happiness level will be much lower if they get you know undesirable dormitory so these are some of the findings uh, or many such research experiment shows in many context with many population that such biases are there within human beings so they are not very good at predicting emotional consequences about a future so when actually that event happens and when they predict it before that uh, their actual emotional uh, the experiences and the, the duration of that experience is much different so what could be the causes behind it why we are not uh, are very good at predicting you know uh, the emotional consequences of a future event so researchers try to find out the causes behind it so one of the cause uh, that uh, the researcher uh, you know said why this happens is called as focalism focalism basically means uh, it is the tendency to overestimate how much we will think about the event in the future and to underestimate the extent to which other events will influence our thoughts and feelings what is the meaning of this is that you know whenever we predict something in future we are only focusing on that event so whenever i am predicting of a even if event x happens in my life or let's say my favorite team wins a game so i am predicting well, at the stage of prediction i am only thinking or focusing only on that event so my emotional whole emotional reaction is determined by that event only so if it is a positive event i i will think i will be very happy 
if that even happens because I'm only thinking about that event. However, when that actual event happens, uh, we are influenced by so many other things associated with that event or at that moment of time. So, when uh, you know your uh, let us say I'm my favorite team wins a game, when actually that event happens, I may not be just only focusing on that sports, there may be so many other things that I need to do at my at that point of time. I may need to complete an assignment, I may not have really you know uh, think you know things to do at my home and so many others you know stress and tension and many other associated things may be there that I need to complete at that time. All this will influence my emotion at that moment. So, it is not just that event when actually it happens, so many other things may influence my emotional experiences. So, that is why uh, so actual intensity and duration may be much less uh, than what we have predicted. So, when we predicted we are only thinking about that event. So, for example, about this dormitory example, when they are predicting they are only thinking about how they will stay in that dormitory and how it will influence them. So, if it is a good dormitory they will say I will be very happy and peaceful, if it is a bad so my life will be kind of hell in that dormitory or something. So, they are only thinking about the dormitory, but when they get a dormitory sir, their life is not just about dormitory. Uh, it also depends on what kind of people they get you know in their dormitory, so many other things they need to do in the college. All these things will influence and that event may be slowly slowly go in the background. So, this is uh, why you know people kind of make lot of mistakes or they overestimate or mispredict while predicting a future emotional consequences about a future event. So, this is called as focalism. Second uh, important reason is called as making sense of novel and unexpected events. So, basically you know whenever a new thing happens, so when we are predicting it may be very new thing for me, so I may be highly excited, so I, I may overestimate its emotional consequences for both positive and negative emotions. But when actually that event happens you know generally we get adapted to the uh, you know, events and situations, we make sense of them. Whenever a thing is very novel, uh, it excites us and we have much more emotional reaction, uh, but after some time uh, we generally get adapted to them because we make sense of them, it is no longer a novel a new thing. So, whenever we predict about a vacation for example, you know for the first time we are going to a place, it is a new exciting novel place and it will have a lot of emotional consequences, but when we go there uh, within few few time we just make sense of the place and other things. So, the emotional in we get adapted to it. So, emotional consequences actually is not that high as compared to when we really predicted that. So, that is also another reason why you know <coughs> many times we make mistakes and overestimate that. So, this impact bias can influence our decision making process on a daily basis because uh, we constantly predicting about things and emotional consequences and, now, and, and our decision you know largely depends on how much emotional consequences we predict in the future. Based on that we mo most of the decisions are influenced by that. So, impact bias phenomena can influence our decision making process in a large way. So, effective forecast and impact bias may influence decision ranging from very simple decision like you know what route to take let us say going to a place x. So, if I think this route will give me a lot of pleasant sites, I will prefer you know prefer those routes or it may be some profound decisions such as whom to marry you know. So, from mundane to profound decisions you know you know impact bias can influence all these you know uh, decisions. People generally make decisions by projecting their emotional reaction to future uh, events. So, impact bias can lead to mistaken projections and irrational and unbalanced decisions in their life. So, generally because of this impact bias many times we take irrational decisions, so, decisions which are not very rational simply because we think emotionally it will not be good or bad, it will be good or bad whatever it is. So, we project some irrational you know projections and we make decision based on that uh, which may not be true or which may you know lead us to unbalanced decisions in our life. So, the, this constantly influences our decision. Research also shows that people can show retrospective impact bias. So, what is the meaning of this uh, retrospective impact bias is that you know 
people not only show impact bias while predicting future events, we also show the, this bias when we remember past events. That is also very interesting. Uh, so, for example, you know most of this uh, you know uh, future event impact bias research, uh, most of these events are not like you know first time it is occurring. So, if people are asked to predict about let us say how they will experience if their favorite team wins. So, they might have experienced such event in the past, it is not that first time they will experience it. So, but the thing is the people again do the same mistake. So, this probably shows you know we do not learn from our experiences. So, many, peop many people of lot of the studies that we have discussed you know people predicted impact of an event they had already experienced in the past, but still they make same mistake while predicting future events. Uh, they could have probably you know uh, made accurate forecast about a future event by remembering or recalling exactly their past experiences, but people generally fail to do so. They are not able to recall their past experiences, emotional consequences properly while predicting future events, because most of the events are recurring in our, it is not that uh, only in sometimes only few events happens which are happening for the first time. Many events happens you know uh, repeatedly and we still make lot of mistakes. So, we do not learn from our experiences in that sense. So, uh, researchers try to find out uh, the reasons why that could be also. So, in case of uh, retrospective uh, impact bias also one reason could be focalism. Uh, this is probably why you know people fail to remember while they remember certain past emotional event, they fail to remember the context and other things that influence them at that time. So, while they remember their past emotional events, they still remember only that event. So, though they fail to remember the context and other events that are you know uh, was influencing them at that time. So, focalism could be also reason for uh, <coughs> this retrospective impact bias. <coughs> So, uh, so generally uh, it is uh, generally not very easy to correct impact bias, especially because of our emotional, uh, whenever we experience emotional thing generally our you know, rational faculty is uh, are not that effective at that time. Uh, so, it is generally difficult to correct impact bias, it, is, it can be mostly unconscious. So, if that is why we do not learn from our experiences many times. However, we can reduce this impact bias obviously by in you know inculcating or practicing more rational thinking and analyzing things especially how they have happened or even in the past case how other things have influenced or in future you can analyze it you know how other things may influence when making a decision not just think about that event. So, other things around that or associated with that particular event how that will influence uh, we can kind of consciously bring and think about that to minimize those impact bias and take more rational and effective decision making. So, these are some of the important things uh, that uh, we need to understand and uh, such biases may influence our happiness also. Uh, so, many times we may we may not really able to correctly predict about our emotions and happiness levels about certain events in future or even may when we reflect back about our past events. So, with this I will end today's lecture, thank you.